Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know, their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff hope you enjoy it please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy and we're live thank you everyone for watching and joining me thank you again also for all of the comments uh, over the last uh, few episodes it's been really useful and today it's a real pleasure to welcome back Stephen Catlin who is the CEO and chairman of Convex Insurance we, we were speaking a few weeks ago and we did a podcast I think in February and so a lot has happened since then. So Stephen, welcome and thank you so much for joining me. Great pleasure, thank you for asking me. Pleasure. So uh, I guess a good place to start, How, how's the last six months, seven months been? It's been an extraordinary experience. Um, I landed up um, being locked down in Bermuda for 14 weeks, largely because I was gonna come back when I could. And then my my wife got flu. We didn't know what it was. So I had to decide whether to sort of cocoon myself in the flat in London or stay out in Bermuda, uh, have a place out there. And my wife and my two girls said, you know what, Daddy? You're safer out there, so stay put. I hadn't <laughs> quite written on being out there for 14 weeks. And I had wow. to say, cooking for yourself and doing my own washing wills for 14 weeks <laughs> was, a, was a new experience. Um, <laughs> But not a bad, not a bad place to be to be locked down, I guess. No, I mean, I had a lovely view, but I mean, I landed, I actually landed up having two day jobs at the same time for a bit because I think you know I became chairman of this pandemic insurance group looking to the future, um, yeah. to set that up from scratch, and on, alongside that, in the, at the beginning of the most enormous capital raise, um, so I was doing two day jobs and I have to I did it for about that for about eight weeks and I have to say by right. the end of it, I was exhausted because my day was starting at quite early because of London time and yeah. finishing at, you know maybe eight o'clock in the evening so I was working all hours got set and a good bit of the time on the weekend and I suddenly realized that I actually hadn't taken time out at all right. I knew I sat down on the sofa one that I got out of work at about 5.30, which was the first time for a long time. That's <laughs> on the sofa. And the next thing I knew, it was 10.30. Just gone straight to sleep. Wow. Um, I, mean, I, I do think the management of time is hard uh, when you're doing all these video conferences the whole time. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have to say I, I didn't manage my affairs that well because I'd land up doing eight hours on the trot nonstop. And that's a long time to concentrate. Yeah. Um, that's a personal position. I think from a corporate position, we were very fortunate. Um, moving people to their homes was absolutely streamlined, no glitches. We were geared up for it anyway. So yeah. we didn't have any <clears throat> width issues corporately. Yeah. I think the thing that we found was that some people have very weak um, Wi-Fi signals, and that was pretty difficult sometimes. Yeah, I also found that actually chairing meetings, you have to. I had to change my chairing style. Um, and whilst you can chair meetings on these media, if it's up to about eight people, it's reasonably okay. But once you get beyond eight or so, you can't see everybody's body language at the same time, and it's very difficult to get interactive debate because people start talking over each other <clears throat> it's hard to because you're not you're not often used to, you can you can read people's body language when you're when you're live it takes a bit of time just to to, to build the rapport on video especially if there's more than one person on the call yeah, it's just two. tiring but it's harder work yeah. yeah i found it in chairing meetings that i had to be rather more prescriptive than i'd normally be and get people to go on mute if they wanted to speak okay. go on mute. And then I'd sort of manage who spoke when, and then make certain that during the meeting I'd go around the table um, one by one, um, 
probably every 20 minutes or so, just to make sure everybody had input. But the trouble yeah. with the video situation is um, he who shouts the loudest can win big time unless he's managed or she's managed properly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've, I mean, and, and chairing difficult meetings um, with the problem or chairing strategic meetings is definitely more difficult virtually. There's no doubt about that. It can be yeah. done. Um, I think in terms of the company, um, <laughs> we've, since that time, we've grown from, when I last spoke to you, it was February, I think we had about 120 people on board then. By the end of this year, we're going to have 300. Wow. So, so we've employed virtually somewhere around 160, 170, 180 people. Amazing. Virtually. Completely virtually. Yeah. Amazing. And that is that is an interesting experience. Um, yeah. Itself. The biggest challenge, though, is we're trying to build the culture in the company, um, and we were doing so, it was going really well. And then suddenly you're bringing these people on virtually. How do you get people into a culture on a virtual basis? That is a challenge. Um, it's super tough. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of go on. No, I say because because a lot of time you know we've been managing these virtual uh, processes, but when you go in face to face, you know you you walk into the office, someone asks you if they can take your jacket, they make you a coffee, you yeah. know you get that really nice kind of feeling. But online, you don't have any of that. I, I think it's like any other video conference call. Historically, if you've already created a bond of relationship with somebody, you can keep it going. By video conference actually creating a relationship over the video is much much more difficult to do and then yes. you basically got to do that one-on-one -on -one. um even then it's not quite the same it can be done i've, pro I've proven that um yeah. but it's not the same and what we've done is had team meetings and uh chat meetings with smaller groups within the organization to try and make certain we remain inclusive as an organization okay. yeah but We've had to work real hard at that. And I've got to say our head of HR and our head of marketing between them have done a really brilliant job in terms of um, getting people involved. I mean, to the extent of them doing each to each individual underwriting unit doing their own video presentation, which can oh, last okay. five to 10 minutes. Some are very serious and a bit heavy. Some yeah. are just hysterical. <laughs> it's just to the whole company. This is to get tell yeah, everyone yeah. this is what we're up to. Yeah. yeah. And um I mean they became quite competitive because you know the <laughs> next one's probably gonna be better than the last one. And the quality of these things went up exponentially over we do two a week at the moment. And wow. uh, I don't watch them the minute they come out, but I'll watch them in batches and it's just fascinating to hear. And it, yeah. it, it does does make it real. And I think that's the thing about things, but how do you make it real? Yes. Also, the other the other thing I found is because not everyone is living in a in a good place. Let's say, like, so I mean, if you're if you're working from your bedroom, if you're if you're sharing your flat, and so whether you're interviewing for a new job, you know, like I don't know, let's say someone was interviewing with you as a final interview, but they don't have anywhere to do the video from. Maybe yeah. it's just the bed or so, so you get, you know, a lot of people have gone through that, that kind of scenario where it's, it's when you step in live and you've got your suit on, it's a bit more, you know, you don't know where these people live, that they're, they're just feeling, you know, it's, it's a tough, tough scenario to do. We found that generically sub 35 is where the real um, struggle is because either people are living in sharing a flat or, Maybe it's a couple with two kids under ten in a two bedroom yeah. flat, no no balcony, you know that you know beam me out of here, Scotty type thing. Yeah. Uh, and I the way I interpret the government's guidance on terms of you can come into work if you need to, and I think there for us there are two needs. One is you just physically need to be there either for a meeting or simply to get some data, and you, you can print it out properly in the office when you can't do it at home. I mean, I'm very lucky I can do it wherever I am. Um, but there's another issue, which is all to do with um, mental health 
uh, and potential depression. And um, I, I take a view that need to go into work could include things like that. Yes. If, you, if you see somebody who is, for whatever reason, really struggling, if you can spot it early enough and get him into the office, um, then you can help. It doesn't get rid of it, but it helps diffuse it. Yes, and but the challenge is, no, because it's virtual, not it's it's much harder to notice if one of your your colleagues or team members is struggling. And also, given the current state of the economy, a lot of people I speak to are quite nervous about saying that to their boss, "Hey, I'm struggling," or you know, I need some time off. You know, they don't want to be the next one to get made redundant or, you know, so it's a very, it's a very tough spot that people find themselves, I think. And as, as, you know, as leaders, it's, 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 I guess, creating that right environment where people feel comfortable to come, to come forward. Yeah, we, we, we've been training up um, about 15 people um, within the organization <clears throat> to be aware of mental challenges. Um, so their part of their day job is they, they allocated teams of people and their job is to watch very carefully. But you can often see through behavioral patterns when yeah. somebody's struggling and you don't have to say anything per se. And then, you know, when we allow people back into the office, they have to ask ahead of time. Um, and we don't ask them to say, I've got a mental health problem. You, you just say, actually, my home circumstances are such I can't work there very easily. So we make it easy for them to come in without having to go through the whole nine yards. But people are careful about what they say. But I think if you get your eyes and your ears open, do you spot it as well as you do face to face? No, but can you still spot it? If you work at it, I would submit you can actually. Yeah. The other thing I noticed is when they, when they shut down eased off and we, we gradually let people come into the office, we started with 10 to 15 before they did the, the last one, um, with restriction, we got to about 86. And it was okay. amazing going to the office. It was absolutely electric. You could feel yeah. it. And people were so pleased to talk, to um, socialize. There was a complete buzz. And then the deflation of one of the three Wednesdays ago, when they said, no, game over. I, I think out, yeah. that day, I think, was probably the lowest morale in our company since we started. Because everybody's got on this upwards trajectory and it's like, oh, here we go again. Yeah, it was the same for us. Everyone was so keen to come back. And, and we started coming back, you know, maybe June, July. And then they just, it, people wanted to come in. It's nice to, you know, to see people. It's nice to have a change of scenery and all those things. And then the streets of London, Fenchurch Street, Leadenhall Street, started to feel a little bit busier. Um, you know, I went out for a few lunches, which I hadn't done in ages. And now I'm in my office today, um, actually probably looking at your building and, and the street down below Fenchurch Street, I can't see anyone. Yeah. I mean, there's like no one. Well, look, Leadenhall Market, I have never known anything like it. I mean, in all the years that I've been working on the city, and I'm not going to tell you how many people I've been embarrassed. You know, I've never known that place other than Brussels. But, you know, Leadenhall Market, I reckon is about 15% of the outlets are open. I mean, yeah. I I mean, some of those people must be either going out of business or out of business. Um, and this second lockdown, the economic consequences for the country are just dire. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you a fan of the second lockdown? You think it's, like, necessary to, to do? Am I, am I a fan? Um, trying to avoid being political. I, I think Boris... <laughs> has always been a bit slow in doing what he's going to do. You know, but the first time around, he was a week late. And the statistics show that there's a cost to that. Um, I mean, the content reacted quicker than we did. And I remember saying to my, my partner, I said, look, I reckon that they're going to have to do a shutdown because it's politically unacceptable so to do within the European community. And particularly with Brexit going on, being a standalone or something like that, didn't strike me as being especially clever. So I think it was inevitable. Um, yeah. I, I think that, it, I personally think they're going to have to open things up for Christmas and New Year. Uh, I think it's a terrible mistake to say you can only have six people in the family 
in one place. If there's ever a Christmas and New Year when families should be together, it's this one. And yeah, I think yeah. whatever they do, they should definitely relax those rules. I think if they don't, they're going to get ignored anyway. So why don't they make it legitimate and just say, right, we're going to open up for well, we 10, 10, 10, 10 days, maybe two weeks, and then yeah. we may have to shut down again afterwards. But give people, give families, family units, the ability to be together through three generations. I agree. I do agree. I, I I I may be not as optimistic as you. I think you know what's the language we will review on the second of December. It feels like, and also again, you know, kind of bringing politics into it. Th there's also a lot of political pressure, you know, for for the government to reduce the R number and and things like that. So it feels like it's now time to buy Amazon shares if you didn't buy them already, because. <laughs> You know, we're not going to Oxford Street or the local high street to buy our Christmas presents. Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, it's another shot in the arm for the Amazonification of the world. But I mean, you know, we talked a bit about the streets being being empty. I mean, I mean, for me, it's this very difficult balance, isn't it, between, you know, the economy, you know, mental health and, and, and well-being and, and and, you know, managing the cases of, uh, of the virus. So it's a tricky spot. You wouldn't want to be in government right now. Well, I mean, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. Um, yeah. It's so criticised. Um, but they are living for the day. I mean, uh, the our pandemic um, future prospects, we've had to put on hold time being, simply because it's impossible to get the government to think prospectively on anything. And I, I've been dealing with government through Treasury. Uh, and, and Treasury have actually said to me, look, you know, we, we, we don't know what they're thinking. We can't get it. And you know what? They don't know what they're thinking. They're just so consumed with the here and now. And I can understand that. But at the same time, we can't live like that forever. We have to have a way forward. Um, yeah. And we have to think about the economic consequences. And we have to think about the cost of lives outside of COVID-19 as well, because the death rate is increasing outside of COVID-19. Yeah. I mean, it's a well-known fact that people are not working, their, their health, both physical and mental, is generally speaking worse than the people who are working. And yeah. people are getting in to get proper checkups for cancer and all that good stuff. You know, and it's been delayed by, well, it, it was six months, it's probably now gonna be another, could be another six months. And, and yeah. there are there are consequences outside of COVID nineteen on the health side, which aren't yeah. spoken about, and they probably should be spoken about now because we've got to have a balance of the perspective on this thing. Yeah. And like any other economy, certainly in the Western world, I mean the states are suffering, the whole of Europe suffering, we're suffering. Um, one of the things I had to do is look at SME, small medium enterprise businesses when considering pandemic prospectively. And I have to say, I hadn't quite realised what percentage of the working population is employed by SME. And it's big. Yeah. Um, is, it over, is it over 50% in the UK? Uh, no, but it's, it's on the way. Yeah. It's difficult to know exactly. It's between 30 and 50. Right, right. And that includes one-man bands too, by the way. Um, but I mean, that's that's the part of the economy that is probably hurting the most, and anybody to do with retail is really hurting. And then the pubs and the restaurants and the hotels, any form of entertainment, well, most forms of entertainment, a little bit of sport, is yeah. really hurt, hurting. I mean, I mean, it's tough. I spoke to a good friend of mine um, in his uh, mid forties. His whole career has been organising live events. Yeah. And, you know, he was like, oh, what do I do now? You know, he's not kind of a techie guy where he could switch to doing the live events because it's kind of more techie people running them. And 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 so it's just I think for, it just seems for a lot of people are just relentless. You know, when you're if you're in an indus industry that's, you know, that's that's been shut down. So if you're running your own business and a lot of my friends run their own small businesses, Again, it's it's almost been like the pace has been relentless. You know, it was like 
kind of buzzwords were like hustle, 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 pivot, 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 um, you know, those kinds of things. And then, and then suddenly you realize you've not taken a break and, you know, people, uh, for me anyway, a lot of people are getting burnt out and, and, you know, they're not taking the holiday days if they're employees for fear of maybe losing their job. And, and this work from home, you know, wasn't, you know, hasn't turned out to be the nice work-life balance people hoped it might be. No, I mean, I, I think this next six months could be worse than the last six months, but it's during the winter. I think people's resolve and energy has gone down because of what's happened. And I, I, I don't want to be doomsday, but I do think we've got a very tough six months ahead of us. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter who I talk to, what age group, what gender, uh, what social background, whatever, everybody is feeling it. Everybody. In their own different ways, and some feeling it more than others. But I don't know anybody who's not feeling it now. A lot of a lot of people. I did um I did a podcast on burnout the other day, and I had I was inundated with with comments. A lot of, a lot of people are just you know it's tire it's tiring. You know they haven't taken holiday days. I think it's 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 a key thing. I don't know about in 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 your in your firm, um, but I think a lot of people have you know just not taken holiday. They haven't wanted to just do, do a staycation or whatever and and you roll out of bed and you start working and your work is your home and your home is your work and I think it just you know overall it just builds up to you know people need to find a bit of balance um and whether that's time or for or what but, but to your earlier point actually it's easy to find balance if you've got space um and it's easy to find balance if you're having, not having to have two, a couple with both at work with two kids under the age of 10. I mean, the stress and strain of that, I just can't imagine um, what they might be I, like. I was, um, I was lucky, well, I say lucky. I mean, my wife um, was working in intensive care with COVID patients the whole way through lockdown. So, you know, tough, tough job. Um, but the, kid, the, the schools took my kids, or our kids, so I could, I could work. But a lot of my friends, you know, and, and our kids are like six and four. Um, I mean, they couldn't do a full day, you know, like one parent would do the morning and the other parent would do the afternoon. Uh, and I think mostly that was acceptable for most companies. You know, they understood that that was the, the scenario. Put the kids to bed, go back to work again. They can both work the same. And that's, yeah. <laughs> that, that's when you get this ridiculous situation. There's no break at all um yeah we certainly encourage if we knew that was the situation we'd say we're expecting you to work half a day and that's it yeah now yeah. whether you do that i mean you you can monitor it you can actually monitor it and if we know somebody's continually breaching it you say oh you know are you sure you're doing the right thing here getting people to take holidays days is we're it, it's a it's a positive instruction from us we expect you to take your holidays right um, um, but actually getting people to do it is a different thing. <laughs> so, you've, so you've also found that people, for one reason or another, have just wanted to get into their work and not, not take time off? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, A, it takes longer doing it virtually. I mean, I think if you live out of town, a lot of people say, God, I'm enjoying not doing the commute. And I get that. Um, although a lot of people who do long commutes work on the commute anyway, it's not dead time nowadays. Yeah. Um, and this, this sort of thing about being at home and if you're lucky enough to have a back garden, whatever, and with the lovely weather. I mean, when I was stuck in Bermuda, believe it or not, the weather in the UK was better than in Bermuda. It was lovely. It was lovely here. <laughs> uh, it, it was blowing a hoolie and pouring with rain, the whole thing. And I ring my wife up every day. What's it like? Well, I was just, oh, it's about 30 degrees. God, I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it did help people. But you see, we're not, you know, we've got the shorter days now. Uh, and you know, I, I just think it's going to be really, really difficult at a personal level, a family level, and at a corporate level. And I think the best thing to do is to be aware of it and talk about it, you know, probably yeah. share problem half. And I think in this type of situation, that is really true. The, the more people are open about it. But when you get people talking, oh, do you feel like that? Yeah. Exactly how I feel. And then you say, oh, I'm not on my own. Yeah. You know, the shared 
challenge. And yeah. there's no, we feel better individually if we think that what we're going through, other people are training the same. Um, I, mean, I used to do uh, the old video conference with mates when I was out of music, just to, and my friends were really good, but I knew I was out of my own there. And we, 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 I made more contact with people there doing that than I had done for years, actually. And you, it's not the same as meeting up, um, but you can, you can help diffuse the situation by communication. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I've probably got closer to my team over the over the last six months because we're we're doing you know a daily call, half an hour. I've been calling up my my team every morning, checking in how they're getting up, what they're getting up, how they're doing, and. I, I don't know. It's just brought people together. Like everyone's going through to your point, the same experience. It's new for everyone. You know, whether you've just started your career or you're leading a company, it's, you know, no one's gone through this before. The people I feel really sorry for are from the age of a level through to about 25, maybe 30. I mean, I know a number of my mates, kids, who have graduated, particularly the ones that graduated last year. I was speaking to one, he, he had a decent degree from Newcastle, I think it was. Um, I said, well, how many people in your year have got a job? And he said, 50%. I said, well, that doesn't sound too bad. He said, yeah, but half of the 50% are on furlough. Oh, yeah. Do they have a job at the end of furlough? I mean, some of them have never actually worked because they've just been sucker home on furlough. Actually, if you analyse it, it may be as little as 25% of his um, group at college have got a job. And there's no real expectation of getting a job in the next two to three years. And then the, what they're frightened about is the longer you don't get a job, the more difficult it's going to be to get a job. And yeah. I have so much sympathy. And how do you have aspiration when you're in that kind of situation? I, and I've heard oh. them, you know, I don't really care about COVID-19. It's not doing anything to me. Um, but I'm being locked down. I'm losing my social life. I'm losing my career. And I know that I'm going to have an increased tax bill for the next 30 years. And I have some sympathy with that position, actually. Yeah. I mean, and also the other thing is, if even if, so for young people that do have a job, I mean, for me, I, I learned so much from sitting next to my managers, you know, yeah. the, 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 the people. You just listen, even... You know, just listening to someone on the phone or seeing how they behave, the way they act, dress, stuff like that. Um, and, and and they've lost that now. You know, a lot of senior people I speak to are saying, well, actually, I quite enjoy it at home. And they're not coming in so much. The younger people who want to come in, they're like, well, my, my boss isn't coming in. And and so so the learning opportunity they're missing as well. And and also you find that, you know, companies, if they are hiring at that at that entry level, people would rather hire someone for a little bit of experience. You know, it's like, well, you know, it's easier to train them or they, they know a little bit of what they're doing. So it's, I think we've got to be a bit braver maybe and just give people an opportunity. We, we, we still, even though we were, you know, effectively our first year, we still did an internship program in the summer. Oh, and we had, I can't about 20, I think. Oh, brilliant. Um, and most of the time they were virtual. We, we did have a closing ceremony, and the most of them came in for that. And it was great. They were energized. They felt yeah. they were doing something. They felt they'd learned something. One of the things we do is some of the individual departments, they have a, a virtual chat line open the whole time. Ah, okay. So they've got, we've, got, we've got one screen to work from, the other one, which is alongside, which you can just chat on there or listen to what other people are saying. It's, again, it's not the same, but yeah. it can improve it a bit. Um, yeah. It's not It's not just the younger person learning from the senior person, which is a point well made, but from a corporate point of view, I reckon some of the best ideas and some of the best decisions are made in the coffee queue or waiting for the lift. Yeah, and definitely. The, that's when you get the spontaneity and the wacky comment. And often those wacky comments, which is what sparks uh, a more serious conversation, which might not have happened had that throwaway line conversation happened. And we can yeah. certainly 
see that. We're, we're lacking that spontaneity that we used to have, and we miss that terribly. Yeah. I guess it's a good segue into, have you had to, kind of given some of those things are missing, have you had to adapt your leadership style in this in this kind of virtual world now? Well, I've already, I've already talked about um, having to um, chair meetings differently. <clears throat> it's not as good. <clears throat> it's not as effective. But if you try and carry on chairing as you used to, it doesn't work. So you have to adapt on that side. Yeah. Uh, for me, what I'm doing, and I'm, I'm in an unusual situation because I don't have direct operational responsibility, and quite a bit of my job is mentoring nowadays anyway. <clears throat> so I have rolling our conversations once a month with a whole ton of people, and I give them, you know, right. one time for an hour. Um, sometimes we talk about one issue, sometimes we just talk shop, sometimes I broaden to how's the family and, and whatever. Um, yeah. to, keep, to keep that communication going. Um, our group executive, we meet um, once a month for two days and once a week for about a couple of hours, depending on what's going on. And we managed to keep that going reasonably successfully. But I've had three conversations today about people saying, you know what, we need to be together, we need to talk. And what I have observed is things that have become cause a certain amount of friction. Um, and if you don't get on top of that, it gets worse than friction. Happen more frequently virtually than they do when you're together. But you, yeah. if you, you realize you're going up a blind alley or it's getting difficult, you can back off or you say, look, tell you what, let's go for a beer tonight and have a chat about it. Or when we go out for a cup of coffee and have a chat about it now. And, yeah. and that, that sort of one-on-one -on -one personal interaction diffuses tension. Yes. It's more difficult, I think, to diffuse tension virtually. And it, it, has, and it you have to diarise it, don't you? It's, yeah. Yeah. it's more formal. It's, can I have a, can we have a chat? You can't just, you know, I don't know, just passing comment to someone at their desk. Do you fancy grabbing a, a coffee or a walk or something? Um, yeah, it's, an, it's, it's, it's more, you've got to be more structured. It's more formal. You've got to work maybe a bit harder at it mm. virtually. Yeah, definitely. How have how have you found personally changing your working patterns? I mean, I guess you were traveling a lot. You know, you're you're in the office, you're meeting people, you're walking around the city. You know, like all of that that great buzz and energy you get from like going into the office and and walking around the city. Has yeah, it been of, difficult to adapt? One of the things I missed is going not going out to the city club which is a tourist <laughs> shop for the insurance industry. And you can go down there at lunchtime, you spend 20 minutes, half an hour there, and you learn more in a half an hour than you learn in a week. You know, <laughs> yeah. so that, that, that human job, I think a lot of people know, um, myself included. Um, I, I'm slightly different, because my role is different to many people there. And because I've been doing a capital raise of, of significance, I mean, those those are really time consumptive and you're just going from call to call to call so i mean we're just about done now and i'm just feeling I'm getting my own personal life back amazing this is your second capital raise as well isn't it yeah 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 um 18 months later and it's roughly wow. the same, and it's roughly the same again amazing it, well, that's a different story but i mean <laughs> i mean so my life has not been whether i was operating virtually or not and particularly when you're dealing with america like i was you know you, you you're used to doing those things by telephone calls actually you do far more conference calls now than you used to which would be telephone calls and the conference calls are better than telephone calls yeah so, you know when you're dealing outside your own time zone and de facto it's virtual um i, I it's certainly no worse than it was it arguably is better okay so your your phone calls are now video yeah so they're saying let's hop on a video okay yeah no, no, I, I i started using facetime <laughs> which i never used to do and every now and again the kids would do facetime 
with me. But I mean, you know, I, as a matter of course, I do FaceTime with my wife now. Never used to do yeah. that. And ring up a mate, do FaceTime. And if it's one on one and you want to have a quick conversation, do it on FaceTime. Yeah. You know? And yeah. From, I, I know I'm, I'm boring old fart, and you've probably been doing it for years, but actually, my generation basically did not do FaceTime. No, but no, but the norm before the pandemic was still a phone call. Yes. It would have been it would have been a bit odd unless I'd organized it to just do, do a video call with someone. Whereas whereas now it's it's the norm. It's amazing that Zoom has become a, a verb as well. I mean, you know, so quickly, you know, let's hop on a Zoom or if, so I think it's you know, I prefer face to face, but I mean th this is is great and it's here to stay for sure. And that's the way we're talking is happening because we knew each other previously. Yes, we met face. We met in person. For that, sure. that was the foundation. And I, that's my earlier point. If you've already built the foundation personally, continuing on on this medium is okay. Creating it on this medium is more difficult, without doubt. Yes, yes. I've also found. So in, in business, the rela relationships have been so important and so much of the work that we've done over the pandemic has been from people that we have existing relationships with, yeah. that I've known already, I've worked with. I think it's quite tough to win new business over, over a medium like this. I think it is, although, I mean, I've been doing investor calls with people I've met before all my life and, and actually, you know, closing closing a, an investor re, a deal virtually. I've never done that before in my life. You, you'd always eventually have a face to face. It was yeah. part of the process. Well, it, that just doesn't happen now. So you've got to do the whole lot this way. Um, yeah. And it, you know, it's we as a board met in Bermuda last week, and the first time the board have met face to face since March. Right. And every single member of the board was so pleased to be there. It's a, they were like kids. You know, it's, they really yeah. were. And we had a dinner one evening out of Bermuda, um, which you were allowed to do over there. And um, we actually didn't talk shop. We just had a just had a breeze. And um, I think it was so relieved just to be together, not confronted with an issue, just chat, enjoy each other's company, and. Talk about the bigger picture. Very hard to do virtually that. Oh yeah, we're human. I mean, ultimately, we want human contact. Yeah. You know, I was reading. Um, can't remember who it was now, but um, I was reading a, an article. I think in the FT by a psychiatrist, and she was saying that often the feeling people get after a, a video call is similar to grief. Um, it's you feel very drained. It takes a lot of your energy away. And she said, you know, subconsciously, people are. Are missing that, you know, that face to face. Because if you, you know, you meet a mate and you have a great chat, it's very energizing. But often the, these videos are quite draining. Yeah. Um, and in a business, in a when you're in a business discussion, you may well have some pleasantries, but not very many. You go straight into the business bit. Then quite often, when you finish, without realizing, you'll spend ten or fifteen, twenty minutes just having a chat. Yeah. Whereas with this stuff. I've got to go. I've got to call in. Oh dear, I'm, I'm two minutes late. Bye. You know, and it's sort of finished. Yeah. Like a and, you're off, and you're off the next, and then you know you're looking. At, you're often looking at yourself, or you know, it's 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 odd, isn't it? <laughs> you're like yourself staring back at you. You're looking. You're not quite sure where to look, and some. It's also hard to look at the camera. You know, it's, it's just a funny, a funny thing. But whether we like it or not, <laughs> the risk of being laboratorial, you know. Do you know what? I meant to go to a loo three meetings ago. I still haven't got around to it. No wonder I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like that, that just sort of. Uh. So, so given given like this is here to stay. What does it mean for, so like let's say the design of your office? Because even when people go back, you know, people are still going to be working at home, right? You're still going to have maybe I don't know two or three of you in the office, five people at home. You're going to have to crowd around the camera and. Do you, do you envisage the kind of the near future looking like that? I think the near future is quite hard to work out because of what's just happened. Um, I think where we were moving before this last shutdown was 
a gradual increase of people in the office reason given previously um and i think most people have decided given that of their own volition they'd like to work in the office two or three days a week at least but they'd love to be at home for four days of say um and do two days work the problem from that point of view as a boss is the most popular day at work in our firm is Thursdays. I don't know why, but <laughs> Thursdays, the place is absolutely humming. And you go in on Monday morning, there's nobody there. You go in there on a Friday, there's nobody there. So we are going to have to say, lay down an edict, you, if you're going to come in more than one day a week, you must come in on either a Monday or a Friday. Otherwise, we're sort of populating the office probably only once a week or maybe twice a week and that's not effective now i mean clearly um the, the space per head has increased hugely so so as to meet and we're taking it very seriously so as to meet the requirements yeah um it's around about a third of the population you got on one floor than, than it was i mean you can push it to a half but you're on the edge then and we've taken the view we're not going to do that. And it's funny because I was thinking to myself, because we've just taken on the, another floor, which is not cheap. I thought, oh, oh dear, but we, we contracted to agency. I thought, have we done a bad thing here? Are, are we mad? Um, but the truth of the matter is at the moment, having extra space, when it does gradually go up, means that we can house a lot more people than if we didn't have the extra space. Yes. Going forward, well, I think that's a different issue. I mean, I've never ceased to be amazed how office buildings have been developing around the city for the last 15 years. We, we, we all know that the population, the workforce in the city is going to go down because of technology. And that, yeah. that's been on the wall for five years at least. Yeah. It's beginning to happen. And th what's happened would probably accelerate that. So the underlying office requirement is going down anyway. You put that alongside the fact that probably, depending on circumstances, people will be working two to three days a week, two days a week in the office rather than five. That decreases, your, if you manage it properly, decreases how much space you have. And then there's a domino effect. So you're going to have all this spare office space in the city. I mean, I'll tell you what, getting prime office space in the city is um, still quite hard and still quite expensive. But the minute you go down to that, se that second tier, which yeah. is perfectly adequate, but isn't quite as eco-friendly as it could be, and doesn't have all the things you get in modern day uh, living, the, the rents are going down through the floor on that stuff. Um, yeah. So what happens to those buildings? I say, oh, well, that's easy to get changed into, into residential. Well, fine, but if the, if the working population in the city has gone down 50%, why does it need another yeah. residential? Who's going to buy, yeah. you know, who's going to rent that or whatever? So I do yeah. think that, I mean, I wouldn't want to be in the property world for the tea in China. Right? No. There's uh, so many, there's also so many new buildings still to go up. Yeah. Um, and there's a big one on Fenchurch, um, behind Hiscox. There's that new big one. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I let's hope they will get filled because that means that the city is, uh, is humming again, but. You know we're in the scalpel, and um, um, from a standing start, I think about two years ago, it is virtually fully let now. Really? But yeah, but that's the prime. It's in a prime location. Yeah, right by Lloyd's. Yeah, and new building, great views, as you yeah. see. Um, yes. Um, so something like that is still at a premium. And there's a reason for that because it works and it's convenient and you in the right hot spot for the insurance industry. But I mean, I'm being broker about insurance, I'm sorry. Um, but the minute you get outside that three minute walk from Lloyd's, which is right between Willis Towers, Watson, and Aeon, and it's a, they're, they're literally about a minute's walk apart, all three. You know, being, being there is where the action is, that's where the yeah. congregation of people are yeah. If, yeah. if in that hub 
it's fine. But when you get just even even a five minute walk radius outside of that, it goes down. You get to ten minutes, forget it. And that's, but it'd be interesting to see though, because you you talked about being in the hub and the thick of it. Yeah. Pre pre pandemic. It'll be interesting to see, you know, if more and more people are saying to their, their staff, uh, and I don't know if you've said this to them, but a lot of people are saying, you know, you, you choose how you work, right? Like it's, you know, the buzzwords work from anywhere. You know, you want to come in a day or two, great. You want to work at home, great. Local coffee shop, fine. So when all this kind of washes over and whatever the new normal is kind of starts to uh, to emerge it'd be interesting to see if if, if indeed that is going to be as busy and kind of hubby as it was well it goes back to the, the comment I made a moment ago the volume of workers in the city was going to go down anyway because of technology yeah uh, and that's at every level including communication right up to digital and AI and all that stuff you know there's a whole range of outputs there so there was a downward trend anyway I think what's happened now is it's been accelerated by maybe as much as two years, which in technology terms is a long time. Yeah. Uh, but I don't see personally businesses where there is human interaction with the outside world. I don't see that becoming virtual per se because people actually want um, to 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 me and in the, the the brokers in our fraternity they hate it because they say it's much easier to broke and get the underwriter to do something if it's face to face yes he's got, you sit down next to him he's got nowhere to hide you just sit <laughs> talk to you whereas you know if it's virtual you just decide i'm going to go another call down it goes just, so yeah. the brokers would tell you absolutely they want to broke to the underwriter face to face so when you got yes. that people to people way of doing business, I don't really see that's going to go away. Um, okay, a, a lot of the back office stuff, a lot of the moving um, paper files around the city, well, it was going anyway. Um, it's just yeah. accelerated that. Um, yeah. But I'd be surprised, actually, I maybe have to eat humble pie on this, but I'd be surprised if the human interaction went. And in fact, if anything, it might just increase a bit once we get through this, because people are going to be so pleased to be able to, even you're doing business yeah. with somebody, it's still a social experience, isn't it? I mean, for me, I, I mean, I, I get so much energy from meeting someone, you know, I really do. I'm, 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 I'm very I'm extrovert. I just, I just really enjoy it. Sit down, have a coffee, talk yeah. about whatever. I just, I just hope that, because, you know, less, less office space, less expenses and a lot of companies are doing that a lot of companies i speak to are trying to reduce their office space to save cost and to your point they probably won't need as much space but i just hope for you know we talked about kind of um front office people you know insurance brokers people that you know they're selling stuff or they need to see people face to face but a lot of people you know um they don't they could do their job from home i i just hope that they are able to come in they're able to to choose to come in and get that 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 human interaction. Wearing a, um, a CEO hat, my reaction to that is, if the CEO doesn't allow that, more for him or her, because actually, even in the back office, in, in fact, you could argue sometimes, especially in the back office, that human interaction is where the ideas come from. It's yeah. where the common purpose comes from. It's where the sharing of problems come from. How many times have you talked to somebody, I've got this problem at work, when you sit down and talk to them and say, you know what, so do I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that comes from conversation, not by emailing or doing a, um, a Zoom. Yeah, yeah. No, I really, I really hope it ends up looking like that. And I think a lot of people, well, I know a lot of people are really, really desperate to come back. I've, I've got so many people haven't come back since the first lockdown. You yeah. know, a lot of uh, many big companies have been closed. And, and as you as you mentioned, I mean, you know, what is it between 70, 50 to 70 percent are working in bigger companies um, and have just not been able to. And they've had this, you know, this this routine of 
you know eat sleep work repeat kind of thing where they're not you know they're not moving and they're not getting out so it'd be interesting to see L- last question on this before we um before we end do you think people are more productive at home i think it depends on the home circumstances and i think it depends on the individual i mean i can tell you um the people in our firm that work better at home and the ones that work less hard. It's not very difficult to monitor. monitor. You just look at the email traffic and the, the, how much email traffic is going on during the day. So yeah. if you if you think something's not working, honestly, it's quite it's quite easy to find out. Yeah, there's, that's there's, true. No, there's no activity. Um, but there are some people who'd like to work on their own anyway, and depending on your job. I mean, some jobs actually want you need peace and quiet for at least two thirds of your working day, so you can be singularly minded and focused. Yeah, uh, and I think those kind of people who've got a good worth ethic probably get through more. People who are easily distracted, um, and people who've got young children, uh, and people who've got other outside commitments. Um, also get distracted and become less efficient. So I, I really don't think one size fits all. I think some people are better true. and some people are worse. That's true. That's true. There's also a very interesting uh, kind of thing going around. There's, I can't remember the psychologist's names, but a lot of people are imp- implementing a fake commute. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> they, can't get, they can't go into their office, but the commute, the commute is, is is great, right? It's like, I know mean, you go from, I mean, people are either walking or they're meditating or some are choosing to sleep in and forgetting about it. But, but the point is, is that that, that kind of movement in the morning just separates and breaks up your day and will start your day well. And it's important to put into your routine, I think. Yeah. I mean, it does. I mean, I'm lucky because I've got, this is my study I'm talking from in London and I, this is where I work, and it, yeah. I'm up downstairs. So upstairs is where the kitchen and the drawing room and the dining room. You know, that's where I relax. So I I, I can in my in location have my workspace, and and I noticed the difference within Bermuda. I didn't have a separate office, um, and so as to keep the living area free of clutter for entertaining, yeah. I put my desktop in my bedroom and the problem with that is your bedroom is your workplace and that isn't so good and that that i did find that impactful actually yeah 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 Yeah. if you're if you're lucky enough to have different spaces i guess yeah you use them well if you're not i think you know just get getting out and moving and then breaking up the day is is really really important Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. Um, always great to hear your insights. And um, it's also great to hear from companies that are growing. You know, you've like what, tripled in size since February, um, which is great. And yeah, really, really inspiring. Well, thank you so much. Enjoy chatting. Um, I, hope, so. I hope your list got something out of it. That's all I hope. <laughs> definitely. No, definitely. Thank you very much. And speak yeah. to you again soon. I see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Bye, bye, bye.